Thank you very much, and Gus, thanks for that really nice introduction. Uh, so I am on sabbatical, and one of the privileges of academia is a sabbatical. And uh, generally, the duties and the teaching are reduced. Uh, but there's one thing I've missed in particular, and, and that actually is hosting um, and organizing Saturday Morning Physics, which I'm not doing this year. It's being so ably done otherwise. But thanks very much for coming. Uh, it's now my uh, privilege to tell you about some of the work we're doing. But that is in the context of this wonderful, mysterious particle, the muon, which I'll tell you about today. So let's uh, go back to the beginning. Um, does this need any adjusting, you think? Or we're good with the sound? OK, sorry. Uh, all right, so um, I will, uh, we'll start at the beginning with the discovery of the muon. And uh, then I will tell you, um, in addition to how they're made sort of naturally, uh, how we make muons, how they're used, and then uh, some of the fundamental properties of the muon that I'm working now on uh, measuring and why that's so interesting. So the muon uh, was discovered in uh, 1937, basically. But I'm going to go back before that a little bit and tell you about uh, what physics was up to in the 1930s. Because efforts were in full swing in the 1930s to understand what was going on in the nucleus, to understand the forces that were binding the nucleus. Um, in 1928, uh, French physicist Paul Dirac uh, developed a new uh, combination of relativity and quantum mechanics. So the, two basic modern new ideas uh, that drove physics in the 20th century, starting at the very beginning of the 20th century, were relativity and quantum mechanics. But they hadn't been combined. The relativity theory did not uh, include quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was not relativistic. But Dirac put them together. We'll tell you more about what that told us. But one of the main things is it predicted antimatter. Um, in 1931, Harold Urey at Columbia discovered heavy hydrogen, which we call deuterium. And heavy water is made up of deuterium and oxygen, D2O. D is deuterium. And it turns out that deuterium is a nucleus made up of a neutron and proton. This was actually before the neutron was discovered. But how could it be that there was a chemically hydrogen nucleus in an atom um, that was twice as heavy? And it was actually a year later that Chadwick discovered the neutron. And um, so there was yet another piece of uh, nuclear matter that needed to be put into an understanding of this. And one of the really puzzling things about the nucleus, since it was known that the nucleus was very small, much smaller uh, than the extent of the atom. In fact, I teach in this classroom. And I use this example for my students um, who, in the old days, they used to have a pencil or a pen. Um, they took notes and things like that. And if you look at the tip of your pencil, and you're in the middle of the room, that is the size of the nucleus compared to the size of the room is the atom. That is the ratio, about um, nearly a million from this, uh, that size. So even though we draw pictures of atoms where it looks like the nucleus isn't a lot smaller so that we could see it on one scale, um, it's not particularly accurate. But it was known that the nucleus was uh, quite small, about um, 10 to the minus 15 meters, or what we call that a femtometer. 15 zeros before the one after the decimal point. And into a nucleus, say carbon or even helium, there's more than one proton. Protons are positively charged. The uh, force between two like positively charged protons is repulsive and extremely strong, yet the nucleus is bound and held together. And this mystery was approached by a uh, Japanese physicist, uh, Hideki Yukawa. And he was exploring this idea that there were particles exchanged. 
So this idea had been around. Heisenberg actually um, uh, helped understand that. So this is one of the equations that I want to introduce here today. This is a, a way of writing the Heisenberg uncertainty <laughs> principle. This says that it's possible to uh, produce a little bit of energy, delta E, so delta means the change in energy, for a short period of time, delta T, as long as uh, that's bounded by this quantity which governs quantum mechanics, the H, which is Planck's constant, and in fact divided by 2 pi. Um, so Yukawa's idea was that a proton in the nucleus somehow moving along, uh, it, along time on the bottom axis in this picture and space on the vertical axis, um, emits a particle x. We don't know what that particle was. He didn't know exactly what it was. Uh, but it's absorbed by an, another proton in the nucleus that really, really wants to absorb it. So in a sense, that second proton is drawn towards the first proton by a force much stronger. Think about the sort of attractions that you just can't resist, right? Um, much, much stronger uh, than the electrical repulsion. And because the size of the nucleus is known, um, and an, yet another thing, we can turn delta T and delta E into these two things. Delta E, the change in energy, is mc squared for this particle x. And delta T is the size of the nucleus divided by a velocity, which he put in the speed of light. And if you do that, it turns out to this predicted a particle about 200 times the mass of the electron. Now, the proton is 1,000 times the mass of the electron. 200 times the mass of the electron is more than the electron, less than the muon. So they called it, they used the Greek term for medium. They called it a meson at the time. There was uh, that uh, term bounced around quite a lot. So let's uh, move to experiments. This is Carl D. Anderson, um, who was using a device called a cloud chamber. Um, and uh, he wrote a paper in 1932 entitled, this is the title of the paper, The Positive Electron. And um, what they were exploring is particles that were produced naturally. They were called cosmic rays because they appeared to come from the cosmos, from outside the Earth. And uh, I loved the way papers were written at the time. On this certain date, we observed using a device um, that was built by R.A. Millikan, another famous uh, physicist uh, at the time. And uh, this is what we saw. Okay, so let me explain this to you. First of all, it's a photograph. It's a photograph in a vapor where when a charged particle, in this case a positive electron, um, goes through it, it tears the electrons away from the atoms and um, in so doing causes the vapor to condense little droplets around that path. And it traces out the path. And the path sustains itself long enough to take a photograph of it. So they take a lot of photographs. And uh, quite a number of people investigate these photographs. And they found this really amazing thing, which is interpreted in the following way. If the positron, the positive electron, comes from the bottom of this um, thing, and I'm going to sh uh, show you a demonstration so you'll have to uh, concentrate on the outer parts here. Um, and there's a magnetic field, which produces a magnetic force. And let me just illustrate what happens to a negative electron uh, when we do a positive force. So can you see this device here? All right, so this device is uh, its called an oscilloscope. But for our purposes, it, it's a, a beam of electrons coming towards you from the back of this. And um, electrons have a charge. I can move uh, the beam around. Um, just by changing the electric force on it. Okay, so I'm just changing a voltage on some parts of this device, which changes the electric force. Um, but I have here what I want you to recognize as a magnet. And how do we know it's a magnet? Well, it's a magnet because it sticks to things, right? And in this case, it's uh, sticking to the board. Um, but you can recognize this as a magnet. And um, what I'm going to do is with the magnetic field strongest near the end of this magnet here, I'm going to bring this magnet towards um, and away from
from my electron beam, negatively charged electron beam. I can't change those to positive electrons, but I can change the magnet from north pole to south pole and notice that it goes up. So by looking at the direction that the particle was deflected uh, by the magnetic force, that is the direction, the curve of that path is the direction that a positive charge would move. Moreover, that charge went through a lead plate, about a third of a centimeter, three and a half millimeters of lead. And can you see, can you tell that the curvature above is a little bit more, it's more curved than below? That means that the particle lost some energy in the lead. And this is how they understood the properties of this particle. Because it's positively charged, and it does, it loses energy just like an electron would in lead. So it was surmised that it uh, had the mass of the electron, but the opposite charge. And this was the first, um, this was the discovery of the antimatter that was predicted by Dirac just a few years before. Um, Anderson um, won a Nobel Prize for that work in 1936, but he did not rest. And working with um, Seth Nettemeyer, another physicist at Caltech, they continued. This is also a, one of those photographs, uh, but it's a different one. And there was this track that was really hard to understand. You can sort of see this is the same picture. There's a, a plate through the middle. And they didn't know what this was. It was mysterious. People were discussing it for quite a long time. And so they did some more really detailed measurements, a little um, more detailed to describe. And then a year later, after the Nobel Prize was awarded, uh, wrote this note on the nature of these cosmic ray particles. Um, and they put a one centimeter plate of platinum and measured how much the curvature of these particles changed. Right? And that is a measure of how much energy they lose. So on the left graph, the vertical axis shows how much energy the particles lose essentially given by their curvature after going through the plate. And the horizontal axis shows the amount of energy that they had initially, the curvature before the plate. And electrons, this lo solid line uh, on the graph on the left, the diagonal line, is the theory for electrons, which was working very, very well. But you can see that some of the points fall well below that line on the graph. And on the right side, we have what scientists like to call a histogram. This basically says, if I break my graph on the right up into little boxes, how many of these events, they're called, go into each box? And the electrons cluster around the center the way they should, as expected. But then it started growing and appearing on the right side, uh, this shaded area, which uh, lost much less energy. The term was more penetrating. And that was the muon. And because the amount of energy loss depends on the mass, the energy loss was too small. That meant the mass was much larger than the electron, but smaller than the proton. And uh, so it's those events in the red circle that are in the shaded region here. So he suggests, again, writing as we can't get a paper published like this these days. We should like to suggest merely as a possibility that the strongly ionizing particles of the type in figure 13 in the upper left, uh, although they occurred predominantly with positive charge, but sometimes with negative charge, uh, may be related with this penetrating group in the red circle above. Um, so just to summarize what they found, that particles heavier than electrons, but lighter than protons existed. So they were medium mass or meson particles. Uh, there were both positive and negative versions of these. They could tell by the curving left and right. And of course, the question was asked, was this the particle predicted by Yukawa? And um, Yukawa, this was in 1936. World War II ensued, et cetera. But Yukawa kept working very, very hard on this, about the, what the nature of those particles should be. And the answer is no. Uh, but he did win a Nobel Prize in 1949 for particles, the pion, which was discovered just a few years before in the positive and negative version of the pion and the neutral or pi zero version of that in 1950. And one of the things that's different about these is that they have very strong interactions with matter, whereas muons uh, and electrons, no. So this was not actually that discovery in 1936 was not Yukawa's particle. It was what we call the meson. 
And we now know that it is not strongly interacting, it's weakly interacting. I'll explain more what that means. And also that it's a particle that has intrinsic angular momentum, or spin. And it's a particle that would obey the Pauli exclusion principle of chemistry, but physicists call that a fermion. Okay, so basically a particle with one half this uh, quantity H, in this case H bar, of angular momentum. And um, Robbie uh, was uh, one of the leading physicists of the time. Everybody would say, well, what do you think, Robbie? And Robbie said, um, who ordered that? Okay, it's, just, it's just a mystery. But now we know because we've learned so much from the muon. So the muons that Anderson uh, first observed, Anderson and Nettermeyer, and have been observed since, are cosmic ray muons. And so this is how they're produced. They're produced by mostly, but not exclusively, high energy protons coming from the cosmos, uh, coming from outer space. That's good enough for us right now. Uh, that uh, collide with the upper atmosphere. So the atmosphere of the Earth, of course, expend, extends out uh, extensively until some point you can say there's not much atmosphere anymore. But, um, but it's very, very tenuous. There aren't many um, molecules or atoms in the uh, atmosphere beyond about 15 kilometers. And at 15 kilometers or so, the thickness, the density of the atmosphere gets sufficient that the protons are likely to find a nucleus. The atmosphere is mostly made up of nitrogen. One of the things that happens that I don't have on this slide is that nitrogen-14 and protons undergo a nuclear reaction to produce carbon-14. That is the production mechanism for carbon-14 that's used in carbon dating. But muons are produced because when high energy protons collide with nuclei, they produce these particles, pions. So if we go from the very top of the graph uh, downward, you can see sort of the transition of these particles as um, they undergo their processes. So P plus N, protons plus a nucleus, goes to these uh, pi-like particles, which are strongly interacting, but they're unstable. They decay pretty quickly, within a nanoseconds, basically, um, into muons. And both positive and negative muons, because both positive and negative pions are made. And then this other particle to the right of my red circle, which is the uh, neutrino, that we now know is associated with a neutron. Another exotic particle, not really the topic of today's discussion, but what I do want you to know is that when there is a weak type radioactive decay of a particle, neutrinos show up. They're very hard to detect. That's a, an entire science in itself uh, and a very active field, and there's a lot to learn from neutrinos. But today we're talking about muons. So uh, some of them get to sea level. And um, what we're going to show you uh, this. This is uh, probably one of the most used Saturday morning physics demos ever. Um, who's seen this one before? This is the Cosmic Ray Telescope. God, that's not so many hands, but <laughs> I have two. All right, at any rate, so what we have here, it's called a telescope because its job is to make sure that the uh, radiation, or just to help us determine that the radiation, that these two radiation detectors at the top and bottom are detecting are indeed due to things mostly coming vertically downward. Okay. The downward part is a little bit difficult with this apparatus, uh, but trust me. All right. And um, what you can see here on the oscilloscope trace in the middle is uh, the top detector. And every now and then it gets, uh, we call that an event or a pulse. Um, there's some electronics that makes it look that way. And then the bottom detector. And the purple line at the very bottom is telling us when the two of them come close together in time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do this um, now, Monica, which is um, show you that if we look at just one of them, which is the top one only, there's not many, we call them coincidences, uh, with the bottom one. However, um, when we require the coincidences, every now and then there is one. So these we identify mostly with cosmic ray muons, these coincidences. And I just want you to get an idea that uh, this is a rule of thumb. All right? So your thumb is about one square centimeter. And there is about, if you do this, 
There's about one square, uh, one muon per minute per square centimeter. Okay, so there you go. Now we're not going to wait for the next one. Uh, you hold out your hand, that's about 100. And, uh, and of course, they're going through our bodies, and uh, there are many, many, many consequences. So um, the muons get to sea level, and this is uh, an interesting thing in itself that we'll come back to in a moment. So let me summarize uh, what we know about the muon now. Um, well, we know that it's mass. Okay, it is a medium mass. It's about 207 times the mass of the electron. Um, and uh, I have some little symbols to indicate, in this case, that the muon is a particle with mass. It has a charge that's equal, uh, positive or negative, to the elementary charge, the charge of the electron. The negative and positive muons have a very tiny uh, limit on the difference of their charge uh, here. And the charge itself, OK, so it's a little uncomfortable to always use these um, not necessarily meaningful uh, scientific units, 10 to the minus 19. So I decided to introduce something even more confusing, which is um, a Greek term, which is addo. So addo is 10 to the minus 18. So it's uh, 18 zeros before the one on the bottom line here. And I just have here, for your reference, a little chart of all these prefixes that we use. So um, I don't, physicists don't generally do this, but now if you ask a physicist um, what is the charge of the electron, they'll say uh, one-sixth of an atto coulomb. So that's the charge. And as I said, the uh, positive and negative muons um, have very nearly the same charge. The spin or the intrinsic angular momentum is one half of a fundamental unit of quantum angular momentum. So it's one half of that unit. Um, the number doesn't matter so much. And the magnetic moment of the muon, a topic of my own research, uh, is here. So um, I, there aren't a lot of equations in my talk today, but there are a lot of digits. And this is to indicate uh, that these measurements are extremely precise. In fact, we don't usually carry around all the digits, but we talk about things like parts per million, parts per billion, and even, we hope, parts per trillion. And just to let you know, we're in the parts per billion realm right now. So PPB is parts per billion. And the magnetic moment is known to a fraction of a part per billion, just under that. The magnetic moment of an intrinsic particle with spin, so the arrow represents the spin, um, really just gives it a north and a south pole like the magnet that I showed you before. Um, so it has a magnetic moment. Any particle with spin can also have a separation of its charge along the spin axis. That's called an electric dipole moment. Something I also work on, but not today's topic. Um, and it is an unstable particle. It decays itself. Um, it, when it decays, it decays into lighter particles, the electron for the negative muon, the positron for the positive muon. And because it's a weak interaction, there are associated neutrinos. And there's a lifetime of the muon, 2.2 microseconds. And uh, that's very measurable. Um, the other thing is it has no... Uh, physical extent. As far as we know, it's point-like or fundamental. And it's considered a heavier version of the electron that occupies a place in the uh, set of fundamental particles of what's called the standard model, standard model being the physics mathematical description of what are the fundamental pieces. They're all shown here. Um, the top uh, ones in red are the quarks. The bottom ones in green are what we call the leptons, which are the uh, electron, the mu, and a third generation, the tau, um, which was probably provided because we couldn't figure out why we got the muon, and their associated neutrinos. And then ways to understand what the forces among all these are called force carriers. And then one more piece um, that was first observed as a physical particle um, about uh, seven years ago, which is uh, what was called the Higgs. So muons decay. Um, so let's start with a muon, a positive muon. And this is uh, what a decay looks like. All right? So it disappears. Um, and it, there's a positron and two neutrinos um, that emerge. So we can write the decays like this, a positive muon going to a positive electron, a negative muon to a negative electron and its neutrinos. And this measuring actually the 
half-life, essentially, of the muon at rest has been so fundamental, there it is again, uh, that it has told us uh, fundamental features of the standard model. It's really provided a lot of the scale here. The muon has charge, so it interacts with electric and magnetic fields and a magnetic moment. And it also interacts weakly. And in terms of the standard model, we associate the uh, electro and mag electric and magnetic interactions with the gamma, which we, is the photon. We call that a photon. And the weak decay with another particle called the W. So I uh, want to tell you one way to measure the muon lifetime, because I did it last week. And this is a tank, a 55-gallon drum, of, uh, filled mostly with mineral oil and a chemical called a scintillator uh, that has the property of producing flashes of light when ionizing radiation goes uh, past it. And also, um, at the top in, in gray are two devices that look into the tank, and they can detect the flashes of light. Now, the muons that get to sea level are mostly going pretty fast, close to the speed of light. But there's a whole spectrum of them. Some of them are slower. And every now and then, one of them is slow enough uh, that it enters the tank, and it stops. And when it does that, it produces um, a big flash of light, photon. And those, some of those get to our detectors at the top and are detected. And th we do that here. So um, back to our cosmic ray telescope. And again, focusing just on on the top one here, um, I can change something. You see that yellow thing going up and down here? All right, that tells the oscilloscope to only look at. Remember, I called them events that come above this on the. Oscilloscope. So what you'll notice here is that there are many fewer very large ones, right? So I'm now only looking at the very large ones. Again, back to the small ones. There are a lot coming really fast. And the really, really large ones uh, come rather infrequently. And I don't know. We'll leave it here, Monica. Um, every 20 seconds or so, one of those is a muon stopping as you can see here on the right and left. And then, uh, the, basically, the muon, after it's stopped, at some point is going to decay. So we can measure that time when that, and start a clock, all right, and let the clock tick. And when the muon decays, and again, you, we're going to have to be there. Maybe that was a muon decay, because it also showed up in the, in the uh, a second one of these here. Um, so when the muon decays, we get another big flash of light. And because this isn't really necessarily the best way to do it, I've basically shown you what happens if you draw a spectrum in time of these events. So at the beginning of this graph on the right, on the left, excuse me, uh, on the left is the first big pulse. There's our threshold uh, as a dotted line across this. And sometime later, there's another big flash, which we associate with the muon decay. And we measure that time. And then another event comes through. And it turns out the time's rather different. Okay? It's never exactly the same, because there's a distribution. In fact, the probability that we'll see the muon decay at a certain time after it stops is uh, there's a lot of muon decays. And most of them are at very short times. And some of them fewer of them are at longer times. And if we draw a histogram of that, remember you just put boxes on here and say how many fall on each box, there are more at shorter times on the left and fewer at longer times. Now, these are data that I produced on my computer. The real data um, I spent four days taking. And that's shown here. There are about 17,000 events uh, in four days. And it makes. Uh, very much the theoretically predicted shape. And we can actually extract the muon lifetime from that shape. So this was done. Um, this device, by the way, is just down the hall from my office on the fourth floor. And it's mostly used for the senior physics lab uh, in the physics department. Um, so there's a subtle thing here. It doesn't exactly follow the theory. And that is because there's both positive and negative muons. 
And negative muons have this really fascinating feature that they can be captured and make atoms. And so they have a different lifetime. So it's an analysis problem to isolate the muon lifetime. And there it is again with all its digits. It's known to about a part per million. Uh, it's known that the positive and negative muon decay with almost the same lifetime. Those are the decays. And we draw these decays with a picture like this. Uh, the muon comes along. Uh, the positive muon, for example, it changes into this W particle, one of the fundamental pieces of the standard model, emitting a, a neutrino, which goes off and up to the left. And the W particle then decays into a positron and, a, and its neutrino. So that's kind of a picture of what's shown as an equation, in essence, on the, on the left in green. Um, and this is the most fundamental weak interaction because the muon, the positron, and the electron are point-like particles. They have no extent. They're not like nuclei that take up um, uh, space physically. So this actually sets the scale for the, the fundamental scale for the weak interaction and measures the mass or is related to the mass, which was separately measured of this W particle. Um, so I'm going to um, tell you quickly that, that one of the interesting mysteries, something else that we teach um, our physics students as soon as we get them into modern physics is that 2.2 microseconds is too short a time for a muon to go 15 kilometers because the fastest that a muon could go is um, the speed of light, right? So that's shown here. And that means it takes 50 microseconds to get to the ground, about 25 times the muon's lifetime. And if you do the math, it turns out the probability of that is 10 parts per trillion, 10 to the minus 11. Really, really tiny. Very few mu muons would make it to sea level, not even one per square centimeter per second. And the reason is because Einstein told us well before that, that time is stretched in the frame of a moving particle. So if we're watching muons go past us, it turns out that the average muon's lifetime in our frame, when the muons are moving at nearly the speed of light, is about 50 to 60 times longer, or 125 microseconds, plenty of time for about two thirds of the muons to make it to sea level. Um, all right, so what can we do with those muons? Well, one of them uh, that's pretty interesting has application has been um, uh, to use cosmic ray muons, uh, which are coming out of the sky. Uh, to at different angles, by the way. So this shows that at zero degrees straight down and uh, at 90 degrees, it's been very well studied uh, how many muons are coming. So well studied that if we put a muon detector uh, next to the pyramid and a muon comes screaming in from outer space at some angle and there is that white thing is some sort of space inside the pyramid that no one has discovered because there are no paths to it or any tunnels through the pyramid or anything like that, uh, that that will actually change the distribution of muons on the telescope. You can see that the third line down has a little more muons because the void didn't uh, absorb or take as many muons from space away. Um, and that void is pretty well demonstrated in these bumps in the spectrum here, which are identified with that. So although there is no, currently no information about why that's there, we know it's there. And it's a big mystery, of course, um, to put together the entire story of the construction uh, of the pyramid. Another use of cosmic ray muons uh, is actually uh, in what's called muon tomography. Since they come from all different angles, you can essentially do what is done in computed tomography, CT, an X-ray diagnostic technique that makes um, two-dimensional images of what's going on and here on the uh, upper left is a picture of muon detectors, just like our telescope, above and below um, some container, for example, that wants to be examined in a portal monitor. And the, they can make images of what's on the different slices of those and find out if there's, for example, very dense things, which may be uranium used for nuclear fuel. And on the bottom, actually, was a mock setup at Los Alamos of um, uranium inside a, a 55 gallon drum on the right looking down uh, to see how the uranium is stored in the drum. So there are many, many applications of cosmic ray muons. 
Um, there's also bad news because experiments that want to measure extremely rare events encounter backgrounds. The cosmic rays that are coming through our telescope um, are coming into experiments that are trying to see events that perhaps happen only once a week or once a month. And per centimeter squared, there's one muon per minute. And so that's dealt with, this is the mu to e experiment that uh, Professor Myron Campbell talked about in Saturday Morning Physics last year. Uh, and it's looking for very rare events. And what they do is they surround it with muon detectors, so you can't see the experiment anymore. And th those muon detectors will determine, just as our telescope does, that instead of a real event that they've been looking for by going through both the top and bottom or the sides, that it was um, not an event from inside cosmic rays. Muons. The other thing that's done is that uh, uh, experiments are now being moved underground um, and uh, into mines um, and, and so on, into caverns. The Mont Blanc Tunnel, so tunnels under mountains, so that there is what's called an overburden with a lot of rock above to shield the experiments from cosmic ray muons. Muons are also made by accelerators and at Fermilab, uh, for the experiment I'm going to tell you about, uh, which is um, there is a beam of muons. This is produced in very much the same way, but much more intense, much more intense. Um, millions of muons per second actually can be produced with very high powered uh, beams of protons from the part of the Fermilab accelerator complex. And this is actually a picture that the accelerator people have drawn um, that shows on the left with the green ring, there's a proton uh, beam that hits a, a target of nuclei. Uh, that produces pions. The pions are charged. They can be manipulated by magnetic fields and focused. Uh, and pi pluses, for example, selected instead of pi minuses. And they move into a ring that's on the right side of this picture. As they move around the ring, at some point they decay. And at the end, after three cycles around the ring, um, only a, mu a positive muon beam comes out. That's important. And the other thing is that muons, remember, have spin and magnetic moments. And when the pions decay, the magnetic moment and the spin of the muon at the instant of decay is perfectly aligned with the direction that the pion is going. We're going to make use of that. Um, there are muon sources all over the world. Most of them are built not for fundamental physics, like I do, um, but most of them uh, are built to study materials, biology, proteins, et cetera. So there are many, many applications that I won't talk about today. What I am going to talk about for the rest of my talk is the muon magnetic moment anomaly. So the magnetic moment of the muon is, again, the muon is spinning. We'll show you many examples of this in the next few minutes. But the muon is spinning around an axis. And associated with that is simply a magnetic two-pole or dipole. And we believe that physics should be able to predict exactly what that is, or almost exactly, because nothing's that perfect. So the muon has a magnetic moment. A magnetic moment is uh, essentially generally produced uh, by some manner in which charge is moving. In the, in the permanent magnet that, um, that I've been using for demonstration, that is actually the spinning electrons in the iron atoms uh, predominantly. So, um, but just to illustrate that very, uh, in a very rudimentary way, what we have here um, I hope you can see is basically a coil of wire. And that is hooked up to, this is the evidence, right? That we have a red and a, and a black. That means that in some sense it's hooked up to electricity, right? <laughs> uh, but it's off right now. Um, and the compass needles are, are very sensitive to, I mean, the main, their main purpose is to tell us uh, about the Earth's magnetic field. But they happen to be spending most of their time looking at this magnet. I'm going to move away. And now they're pointing, uh, they're trying to point north, right? Um, so I can influence them with my magnet. But of course, I can also influence them uh, in a very well understood way by putting current through the coil. <laughs> that is an extreme influence, right? 
where it falls off. Okay, uh, by putting current through the coil. In fact, it was such an influence that that, that one was just overwhelmed. Okay, and um, I'm going to reverse it because it's too much like the Earth right now, the way we've lined this up. If I reverse it, I don't know if you remember that the uh, red was pointing that way, and now the white's pointing that way because I reversed the current. All right, so that's a demonstration that when you have charge going around a loop, it makes a magnetic field. And that magnetic field has a north and a south pole associated with it. So we'll call it a magnetic dipole. And the math is, is pretty um, straightforward. I'm not going to ask you to do the derivation with me here today. So I'm just going to tell you the answer. Then when something is going around like this, okay, something's in motion, it has angular momentum. And uh, we use uh, the symbol L. The arrow, remember, was the spin. And it has a north and a south pole. So you just do the math, and it turns out that the magnetic moment, I'm sorry about this, but we ran out of Greek letters by the time the muon was discovered. We were already using mu, but meson is, uh, starts with the Greek letter mu, so we use, use that for two things here today. One of them is the magnetic moment, and one of them is the muon itself. So I'm going to really confuse you when I write mu, mu, mu sub mu magnetic moment of the muon. But nevertheless, it's the current times the area. And I went a little too far too fast. So let me back up here. Um, and uh, it's just a charge of the particle. We know that. The mass of the particle, we know that very well. Divided by 2 times the angular momentum of the particle. And since we know the angular momentum of the muon is the spin of the muon, you can plug that in. And it turns out it doesn't work. It's off by a factor of two. So we put this extra, extra factor g in front. And experiments showed that g was about two. Now Dirac, whose theory predicted antimatter um, by combining quantum mechanics and relativity, uh, also predicted that g would be exactly two, not one, which it is for an orbiting particle. So that was a, that was a triumph. Dirac did also win a Nobel Prize. but then precise measurements in complicated atoms, sodium atoms and gallium atoms at, at Columbia in the 1940s, showed that G wasn't even exactly two, so that Dirac wasn't perfectly right. Now, I'm going to try to explain why G is not two. Um, but before I do, I want to tell you about how that magnetic moment could be measured, not in complicated atoms like sodium and gallium, but um, for a free particle. And in, before we get to the muon, I'm going to start with the electron, because this work was done here. Uh, Dick Crane um, is shown here. This is a picture um, of him. And he was a physics professor for 42 years here. He actually had to retire uh, because it was mandatory at the time in 1977. But he didn't slow down. He moved on to be one of the founders of Ann Arbor's Hands On Museum. Please uh, check it out if you haven't. And he won the National Medal of Science for his measurement of the magnetic moment uh, of the free electron. So that was a much simpler than putting an electron in an atom, which could have been the reason that G appeared not to be two. So here's um, a sculpture <coughs> that is actually right outside. You can check this out uh, by Jens Zorn. Jens is here. He's an uh, emeritus professor in our department, a tremendous artist and historian of physics in, this, in the department, and has been making physics sculptures. And this one commemorates. Um, the experiment of Crane. Now, um, to explain how the experiment works, I'm actually going to use a sketch from Jens's notebook here. Um, and what you can see here is there's a magnetic field that it's vertical in this picture that's applied um, from the outside. And the blue spiral is the, is the helical track that an electron would take in going through this. Now, we have. Um, picture here, a demonstration here of an electron beam in a magnetic field. Do I have to turn anything on? OK. The bottom, the bottom one. <laughs> OK. Oh, yeah. OK. Good. So what I want you to notice is uh, from the direction we're looking, which would be looking straight down in that previous, in that picture, um, the electron has a circular orbit. I also want you to notice with this knob that Monica just reminded me of, um, that we can make the magnetic field stronger and weaker. 
and change the orbit of the electrons. Now, all the electrons in that beam that you see are moving with the same velocity. And so by making the circle smaller, the time it takes to go around a shorter distance is shorter. Right? So I can correlate the time, which we actually use the inverse of time, which is a frequency, uh, with the strength of the magnetic field and other properties of the electron. This is actually how the ratio of the charge to the mass of the electron uh, was discovered. So that orbit is called a cyclotron motion. And, um, and it has a frequency, which is the charge over the mass times the strength of the magnetic field. B is the magnetic field. Um, there's also the magnetic moment is processing. And now we have to demonstrate this concept of spin precession. So spin precession occurs when a spinning object experiences a torque. And I'm going to start uh, with this spinning object, um, a bicycle wheel. Direction of rotation. OK, great. OK, with a bicycle wheel here. And before I actually make this bicycle wheel spin, I'm going to apply a tor uh, a show you that there's a torque on the wheel, right? And the torque is simply due to gravity. It's suspended here and gravity pulls it down. That's a torque. It's changing that, right? But now I'm going to make it spin. So there's an axis of rotation. I hope that's enough. And when you have a spinning axis of rotation, the axis moves around. Careful. <laughs> the axis uh, rotates there. And the rotation of that axis is what we call uh, precession. So that's the spin precession. And since uh, muon is spinning, and we can apply a torque with a magnetic field, which Monica is going to help me demonstrate here, um, because she's very skilled at this and I'm not. So what you see here is um, a little magnet mounted into, oops, the wrong one, a little magnet that's mounted into uh, a ball. By suspending the ball with a cushion of air, we can reduce the friction significantly so that once it spins, there it is. Once it spins, the axis around which it's spinning, you can kind of see. And what Monica's going to do is change the magnetic field produced by these coils. When the magnetic field is large, it's spinning around faster. This is the axis going around. And when the magnetic field is small, the precession is very small. OK, great. Where did I leave mine? <laughs> Aha, good. So um, that is called the spin precession frequency. And it's also proportional to the magnetic field. So if we divide that uh, g, the factor that we're interested in, times e, the charge over the mass, times the magnetic field. If you divide those out, I don't know how fast you can do that in your head, but it turns out that the magnetic field disappears. And in fact, we only get g over 2 when you do the math. So by measuring those two frequencies, we can measure this quantity. And this is the number of digits uh, with which it has been measured for the electron. This is the most precise quantity ever measured for uh, a fundamental particle um, of any sort. This is the magnetic moment. It is a fraction of a part per trillion. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Um, now. To do the muon, we do it a little bit differently. All right? Instead of taking the ratio, we subtract the two. That's all. And what that does is it subtracts the cyclotron motion from the spin motion. And that's done in a magnetic field. But the magnets are rather large. And the top, you can see um, the device that was used for this experiment in the 1950s through 1970s at CERN in Switzerland. Um, and the scale of the magnet is a little unclear. But it's, uh, it's bigger than a person, like much bigger than a person. And on the bottom is a magnet um, that was used at Brookhaven over about a five or six year uh, cycle, built for uh, um, another half decade before that. And that is 50 feet across. Okay, so there's the stairs um, that gives you some idea of what that is. And it's that magnet on the bottom that I'll be telling you quite a bit about today. Um, and the way the uh, experiment is done, as I said, is to take the difference of the spin frequency and the cyclotron frequency. 
That can be measured by taking advantage of the muon decays, and it just gives us, we call this a wiggle plot, um, for reasons that are unclear to me, but maybe you can um, figure it out. And basically, this is a wrapped around, so at the very top, um, the data are in blue, and the uh, experimental mathematics that's done to extract this frequency by saying, oh, this is what we think it looks like, is in green, and you can see how well they match up. You can also see the very first, this goes from zero to 100 microseconds. These muons are moving at nearly the speed of light, like most of the cosmic ray muons, so their lifetime is extended to about 60 microseconds. Um, and they, uh, uh, so this is uh, the first, the top uh, row is the first 100 microseconds, then you go down one, the second 100 microseconds, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, 100 microseconds. So this entire thing is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hundred microseconds of data. And by the end, the muons are going away. That's why the line gets fuzzy at the very bottom right, okay? Because so many of the muons have decayed. But we can use all of those. And at the top, um, well, at the bottom on the right is shown if G is exactly two, then the cyclotron frequency with which they go around the magnet and the spin precession frequency are the same and they stay together. There are no wiggles. G is not two and so we get the wiggles. So we just extract our data from those wiggles. Uh, but since we're taking the difference, oops, okay, so there's a, the answer. Um, it's uh, G over two is known to about half a part per million. That should be PPM, not PPB. I'm sorry, uh, that's a typo. All right, so let me explain why G is not exactly two, and I'm gonna invoke Feynman here. Um, and I, I, the, he wrote this book on quantum electrodynamics that was from popular lectures. I've been working through that book. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I learned from Feynman, but I'm gonna start by saying he reminded me just yesterday uh, that if you can't explain something in simple terms, you don't understand it. So let's, that's a high bar. Let's see how I do. So what Feynman told us to do is look at a space-time picture like this. Okay, so space on the horizontal axis. And motion in space could include um, rotation and a path from point A to point B on this graph. And there's a rotating processing spin. But Feynman said, no, that the way to look at this actually along this path is like this. Okay, it's taking a path, there's many paths, but here's one, the most fundamental one from A to B is that the particle starts at A, starts moving through space and time, but then it encounters the magnetic field, which he indicated by this squiggly line, which is called an external photon. It's the electric and magnetic interaction of the photon is represented this way. And Feynman gave us a set of rules to calculate this, but for this path, G is exactly two. That's one possible path. There are other possible paths, in quantum mechanics, these paths may be called amplitudes, uh, for those people who um, have heard that term. Uh, so another possible path uh, includes what's called an internal photon. Remember Yukawa's particle was exchanged between two uh, protons? Well, this is between two parts of the path that a particle is exchanged. It's electromagnetic, magnetic, um, so it's called an internal photon. Uh, internal Photon. I keep saying infernal photon, um, but that's when I tried to do the calculation myself. Um, so we have to add that new path, which is in quantum mechanics is called adding an amplitude. And Julian Schwinger showed that this was uh, adds a factor of one over 137 pi. Really interesting number. Does anybody recognize 137? Okay, this is a really important in physics. This is the charge of the electron squared divided by H, Planck's constant, and C. And Feynman very quickly told us uh, how this comes about. Each time a photon interacts, you get a factor of E, so there's two, that's E squared. Okay, so I'm just gonna motivate this by noting that every time we invoke quantum mechanics, there must be Planck's constant, H, and every time it involves relativity, there's a C. So that's, <laughs> if I, hopefully, I do understand it, I think. All right, anyway, that predicts this for G, but there are many, many other paths. There's an infinite number of paths. Schwinger, who calculated this, was so enamored 
with alpha over pi, but when we multiply by two, we have to divide by two, so alpha over two pi, that he put it on his, his gravestone, um, which was also um, the monument for his wife. So there are more. Um, another path could be that that internal photon breaks into two pieces, electron and positron, they get reabsorbed. Um, it could be a muon. The, the contribution here goes like the mass of the uh, particle, if it's an electron or muon, divided by mu. So it's much larger for the mu because the muon is 207 times more massive. You could put pions in there that I've told you about today. There can be weak interactions. You can really have a great time drawing these diagrams. Um, there can be also uh, ones involving the neutrino, uh, which was the W. In fact, um, there are professionals who can calculate this, and they, they do this, right? Every time there's an extra connection, there's an extra factor of E, and these become weaker and weaker and weaker. By the way, this really does take professionals. Don't try it at home. Um, and uh, so th there are almost 13,000 of these that have been put into the code to calculate very precisely um, what the magnetic moment is. I uh, don't know what to do with this picture, so I thought I'd just point out a few really cool looking ones with my own diagrams. This is my square. This is my triangle. And I think this is a, my hexagon surrounding some kind of Sesame Street character. So the point is that this is a really intricate thing um, that people have done professionally. So the standard model can very precisely predict um, these G factors. And uh, there they are. Uh, it's good enough to do that. They've been measured experimentally. And um, this is just pointing out that that one diagram makes the muon and electron different. Um, experimentally, those are the numbers, and they're different. Okay, how can I show you they're different uh, quickly? Well, I can subtract them. Um, I can put them on graphs if I've done on the right. And what you can see is that the experimental number, for example, for the electron in the upper left, is not quite overlapping the theory numbers. And for the muon, it's also shown on the right, where the vertical dotted line is the standard model theory. There's about a 15% probability that this would be random error for the electron and about 5% probability for the muon. And this is considered to be um, perhaps indications that the standard model is not quite right. Um, so there could be more to the standard model, like a new particle that is uh, being exchanged. The new particle would add, this is a different picture of that set of standard model particles. They're all there, trust me, the electron, the mu, the tau, all the quarks, and the force carriers, and the Higgs, in this case. And there is a theory called supersymmetry that suggests that there's a whole new set of these, one corresponding to each of them, that we haven't observed yet in any experiment, but that could be x, the unknown. Um, that the muon is not point-like, that there are new photon-like particles, or that the experiment is wrong. So I want to finish up by telling you that we're repeating the experiment at Fermilab. We did this by moving the magnet from Brookhaven to Fermilab. There is the magnet arriving at Fermilab at the um, iconic Wilson Tower. The, the founding director of Fermilab was Robert Wilson, and, and he also was an architect who designed that. Uh, his sculptures are awesome. We make a muon beam, which I told you about before. Um, we improve everything and do the experiment again. So that's what we've been doing for the past seven years. Uh, and the thing that's most important is measuring B. But I just want to uh, show you, I have a little slideshow of moving the magnet, because this is one of the most celebrated uh, activities in physics in um, probably the last uh, few years, at least, uh, when the magnet is moved. So there's the magnet getting packed up at Brookhaven onto this spider. Those uh, silvery things are the magnet coils. Then it was covered and lifted onto a truck. It was trucked only at night, because it was a wide load, um, on highways to the Mississippi uh, to be um, floated up the Mississippi to Chicago uh, area. And, and then all the canals around Chicago went past St. Louis. Um, and here it is uh, near Fermilab. And this is just an indication at uh, how, how celebrated this was. People would come out at night to see it move past. And there it is arriving at Fermilab with hundreds of people <laughs> around it. And that magnet was installed, there it is, um, in a new building that was built for us uh, that, uh, at Fermilab. OK, 
Okay, that didn't work. There's a collaboration of about 200 people from um, three continents. Uh, the, we can't, I can't show the names, but I can give you a sense that there are quite a number of countries involved with that. The last thing I want to tell you about um, is that the, one of the crucial things is to know how strong the magnetic field is, and that's what my group does. Um, and there it is. The quantity we want to measure is A. The magnetic field is B. Um, so that's the one that we want to measure. And there are many, many ways to, to measure a magnetic field. Um, the, I'm going to um, skip this, but I'm going to tell you that, uh, actually, I'm going to skip. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. But um, your, all of your cell phones, I was going to show you my cell phone, but I won't take the time to do that. But I want to assure you that those of you who have cell phones and have used it for navigation uh, have probably noticed that it tells you what direction the phone is, is facing or what direction north is. And that must be because there's some kind of detector inside that knows north. And it's not a compass inside the cell phone. It's a magnetic field detector um, called a Hall probe. And so you can buy those, but most very sensitive magnetic field detectors, certainly as sensitive as we need, subpart per million, part per billion, um, uh, you can't buy in the hardware store. And it works very simply uh, in, from a quantum mechanical sense. There's spin up and spin down represent magnetic field uh, pole north up or down. And so in a magnetic field, they have different energies. So at that magnetic field, there are these energies. And we can measure that energy. Actually, we measure a frequency. And um, all we have to know to do that is the magnetic moment of the particle. You just do the math, again, after measuring a frequency. And the very best quantum magnetometer has been developed now in my lab, which it uses helium-3. It's in a little glass cell. Um, it uh, glows because we make a discharge in that to help us prepare the helium-3 atom. And then we put that in a device that, in its prototype stage, looked like this, involving a laser coming in the white line from the right. The laser um, is the black thing on the left in a little bit of a magnetic field in our development. And uh, with my graduate student, uh, Midhat Farouk, and some others, we uh, went to use this MRI magnet. By the way, and you're probably used to looking at MRI magnets like that. But what's on the inside is that. And because they're all being upgraded, we have access for free. All we have to do is pay to move them uh, to that magnet, which we've used. Um, and the device has changed the way it looks. The blue on the left and on the right are fiber optic cables that bring the light in from the laser. And uh, we mounted it on a device where we basically recalibrated it. The frequency was measured uh, from figuring out the, how fast the wiggles were in signals like that. And to give you an idea, between 84 and 86 um, on that is about 30 parts per billion. So we're measuring this with all the corrections to 20 parts per billion, which is entirely sufficient. So to summarize, um, the muon, which was discovered in cosmic rays and is produced in cosmic rays, and cosmic ray muons are both used and, um, and, a, and a pain for some experiments, uh, confirms Einstein's time dilation prediction because we get them at sea level. It's a tool for archaeology and homeland security. The muon lifetime is, sets the strength of the weak interaction. Uh, the magnetic moment anomalies are intriguing challenges to the standard model. It may be where we're going to find new physics beyond the standard model. And this adventure of G minus 2 from moving the magnet to making the world's best magnetometers has been extremely exciting. Um, so that's a new standard of magnetometry. So I want to thank um, the Chup Lab. That most, many of them are shown here. Um, I want to thank my collaborators. Uh, including the ones who helped very much with the helium-3 development, the funding from the National Science Foundation, the Office of Science of the Department of Energy, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, which is partially supporting my sabbatical this year. Um, Ramon Torres, who helped me measure the muon's lifetime. And of course, the demo lab staff of Monica, James, and Nick. Um, you're wonderful. And thank you, everybody. <laughs>